Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Lover, a volunteer with the Friends of Great Swamp. Thanks for coming out today. Hello to our Zoom audience, and welcome to the Friends Second Sunday program. Please note that Second Sundays are made possible by the Friends of Great Swamp and by the generous support of the Marta Heflin Foundation. Today, we are excited to have Barry Bowman and his presentation, Geology, the Glacier, and Great Swamp. Now, preparing for today's program, I got to take a look at Barry's resume, and I can tell you it's impressive. In fact, in the field of geology, Barry could be considered a major rock star. <laughs> Barry grew up in the town of Berwick, Pennsylvania. As a small boy, he loved exploring the Pennsylvania woods. As a teenager, Barry became an Eagle Scout and led nature walks at Boy Scout camps. When it was time for college, Barry enrolled at Penn State. I'm a mater too, go Lions. By the time he left State College, Barry had both a bachelor's and a master's degree in petroleum and natural gas engineering. After college, Barry worked in the oil fields of Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma. He then moved to New Jersey. He earned his master's in finance from NYU. With that degree, Barry went from drilling oil and gas wells to lending oil and gas for the Chase Manhattan Bank. By the end of his career, Barry was on Wall Street manage, managing energy investments for Morgan Stanley. When Barry retired from business, he moved to his next career, Friends of Great Swamp Volunteer. As a volunteer, Barry has enjoyed greeting visitors for the past seven years, encouraging them to explore all that the refuge has to offer. This past July, Barry received the highly regarded Blue Goose Award. The Blue Goose goes to those individuals with 1,000 hours of volunteer service here at Great Swamp. By now, you may have noticed the theme. Barry loves a good challenge. So with that in mind, Barry offered to do a second Sunday presentation on the geology of Great Swamp. We, of course, gladly accept it. So for those here at the Visitor Center, for those on Zoom, please join me. Let's give a warm welcome to geologist and friends volunteer Barry Bowman. Thank you very much. <laughs> Greetings. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for a moment throughout. Wasn't sure who Paul was talking about, but <laughs> but do welcome. I'm glad you in spite of the weather did come today. Um, with Queen Elizabeth's passing and anniversary of 9-11 today in our minds, I wonder, and we're focusing today on the past, I just wanted to focus for a minute uh, on briefly on our planet that's been around for a long time and hasn't changed since it's been formed billions of years ago. Where's my thing here? Okay. Okay. This is a, uh, our planet. It's uh, depicted as a ball with concentric layers. It's 4,000 miles, 4, miles from the surface to the center. The inner core is solid iron nickel combination. The outer core is a molten iron nickel combination. It's a semi-solid semi mantle uh, with a relatively thin, uh, thin crust. Thank you. Ah, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> now we can tell the layers, <laughs> since that's why we had the diagram. Uh, this ball reminds me of the flashcards we used as kids uh, to learn math with. You remember them? Well, you do. Okay. <laughs> they weren't fancy, but we so we were able to concentrate on the numbers on them. Uh, this ball is about the same as that. Uh, all the layers uh, are all the same size. And they're in warm colors so that you can concentrate on learning the names of the layers. The ball is incorrect geologically. 
Uh, the layers are not the same. Uh, the mantle there in the red is uh, com comprises 84% of our planet. The core is about 15 and the crust is 1%. The mantle, the biggest part of our planet is where the tectonic plates are located and are in constant motion. They bump together, they separate and they overlap each other. Earthquakes and all volcanoes that are seen and felt on the surface of the earth here occur as a result of the motion of these tectonic plates. If the plates bump together, seismic waves come up through the mantle and are felt as earthquakes on the earth. If the plates separate, the molten lava from underneath and the outer core comes up from beneath, moves through the separation and comes to the surface of the earth as a volcano. Now, as far as earthquakes go, the tectonic plates have been very good to us in here in New Jersey. The nearest tectonic plates to us are 2,000 miles away down in the middle of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. Most of the seismic waves that are generated by those plates bumping together are either not strong enough to make it here to be reached to be measured, and those that do make it are felt as tremors. The strongest earthquake in New Jersey and the first to be measured occurred right here in Mars County in 1783 and it was 5.3 on the Richter scale. Now the magnitude of volcanoes are measured by numbers on the Richter scale. And the higher the number gets, like around seven, higher than that, uh, do significant damage. For instance, the San Francisco earthquake in 1906 that killed 3000 people was 7.8 on the Richter scale. And the earthquake in China last week that killed 86 people that was 6.8 on the Richter scale. There have been 200 earthquakes since uh, 1783, and they have ranged here from 0 0.1 to 4 on the Richter scale. The most recent earthquake was in Milford, New Jersey, in Hunterton County, and measured 2.5 on the Richter scale. Geology experts are now predicting the future activity of earthquakes in New Jersey will be sporadic and minor, pretty calm. Oops. That's not moving. Oh. <laughs> I think Tom. Yeah. It's not working. Huh. There's Tom. But can't make it move on the computer. Either. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hmm. Did you do it? It's on the screen. Oh, here. I'll stay up here. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Now let's take a look at, at the surface of our Earth back 225 years ago. We have that back on the top. We're not be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zoom is going to get me down. Oh, there it goes. Okay. 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 We're taking uh, take a look at our Earth twenty five two hundred twenty five uh, million years ago. Uh, Starting at the top left, you see Pangaea there, go across to the right, then drop down left to right, and down at the bottom is where we are today. You notice that 225 million years ago, there was just one supercontinent, it was named Pangaea, and it was surrounded by one ocean that was called Penthalassa. Pangaea lasted for about 100 million years. Uh, the 
tectonic plates were very active, just like they are all the time, causing a lot of stress on the planet. And as a result, the planet started to fray at the edges and crack and off and move away. You can see them slowly across each one, slowly moving away. In the second slide to the right at the top, you'll see where North America is starting to separate from Pangea 200 million years ago. The dinosaurs existed for 165 million years on Pangaea to the end of the first two rows across, ending at the Cretaceous on the right-hand side of the second row. Uh, since they lived on Pangaea when it was basically one supercontinent, and now we have seven, uh, dinosaurs are found on all seven continents today. There were no people living on the earth when the dinosaurs were here. The dinosaurs were extinct 65 million years before the first human appeared. Now that we've seen what happened in the last 250 million years where we've gone from one supercontinent to a second one, uh, down at the bottom where we have now seven continents, what's gonna happen in the next 250 million years? Well, if you thought it was hot last August when it was 100, 100 degrees, when it was 100 degrees every day, you should be down at the core where it was 9,000 degrees. Our planet is very hot. Uh, the temperature is at the core, as I said, was 9,000 degrees. The surface of the sun is 10,000 degrees. So we're getting close to getting really hot. The temperature of the outer core on the in the mantle is 2,000 degrees, 7,000 degrees. The lava that comes out of volcanoes that we see on the Earth, remember that's melted rock. And so the temperature is 2,000 degrees of lava that's coming out of the volcanoes on our Earth. The deepest hole in the planet uh, that was drilled was to a depth of, of 40,000 feet. That's like eight miles. Uh, as I told you at the beginning, the distance to the center of the earth from the surface is 4,000 miles. So we've just scratched the surface, drilling the deepest hole ever drilled in the earth. And the temperature at the bottom of that hole was 400 degrees. So we can see there's a lot of heat transfer going on in our planet. Mathematical models and 3D simulations are now showing that this heat transfer in our planet combined with the motion of the tectonic plates that we know are always in motion, are what make continents move. So now they're suggesting that our continent's about to move again. Two have already started moving. Africa and Australia, scientists tell us, are already inching toward Asia. Models are now showing that North America will eventually join the other three and form a new supercontinent called Amasia. South America and Antarctica, Antarctica are not projected to move. So at the end of 250 million years, there will be three continents now instead of seven we have now. Now we can go back to 200 years at the top right when North America was starting to separate from Pangaea. The geological area we live here in New Jersey is called the Newark Basin. The rocks beneath us here are mostly sandstones and limestones that are sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks are like lake deposits. That means they were laid down in a nice quiet lake environment. When the tectonic plates again were starting in motion and very much active when Pangaea was being split up, a crack or a fissure appeared in our ground here in the North Coast Pages, and molten lava flowed out. This is called an extrusion. You've probably seen on TV how fast lava in, from volcanoes can move. It can move as low viscosity, and so it can travel very fast and cover a wide area before it cools and hardens into basalt. Okay. Hold on, we're gonna try it. This one. No. 
Ah, there you go. Okay. This is basalt. <laughs> this is basalt. It's a fine-grained igneous rock. 90% uh, of all the volcanic activity on the planet ends up being basalt. Uh, in fact, if you look up and able to see up in the moon tonight, those shaded areas on the moon are basalt. And it's occurred there because of volcanic activity on the moon. Okay, so now we have an extrusion and it uh, comes out, the lava flows, covers a big area, causes a ridge of basalt in New Jersey, and it cools and hardens. Then 500,000 years go by and we have another extrusion and another second ridge of basalt forms in New Jersey. Then another one and a half million years go by. This is in geologic time, so it's millions of years are like a week. And there's another extrusion and a third basalt ridge forms in New Jersey. Okay, how am I gonna turn into this thing? Okay, thank you. So now we have three ridges of basalt in New Jersey. They are named the first, you see the ridges there going left to right, one, two, and the Roman numerals there in the middle. That's the order they were laid down. We have the three ridges. Uh, they are named first, second, and third Wachung Mountains uh, using the Lenape, Lenape Indian words, Wach Unks, which means high hills. Uh, these ridges are about four to 500 feet high. Uh, the second and first and second Wachung Mountains, the two there on the bottom, extend continuously in a crescent shaped belt that go from Somerville down here at the bottom up to Mawil up at the top near the New York state line. The third Wachung Mountains, you can see starting there around Liberty Corner, they're somewhat discontinuous and goes from Liberty Corner up to Pompton. The Wachung, third Wachung Mountain is the one that's right down the road here in the end of Pleasant Plains that are on the southern border of the Great Swamp. Okay, we see in the middle there, you see New Vernon and Long Hill, that little shaded area. Those are two small basalt ridges that are only 100 feet high. And because they're sort of short compared to the other ones that are four to 500 feet high, they don't rank to be called the fourth Wachung Mountains. We can move it again. So, oh, too much. One, go back. Thank you. Okay, there's the three ridges again uh, from right to left. And then you see over there between Morristown and Long Hill, you see the two little basalt ridges. Uh, the one on the right is not named, but the second one is Lee's Hill. Now we recognize that here because Lee's Hill and Lee's Hill Road are right here on the northern edge of the swamp. Uh, these are subnamed. Uh, because of their size, their sub-ranges of the Wachung Mountain. Now, mm -hmm. in this little ridge, Lee's Hill, it was common to see deer resting and lying on this little ridge and basking in the sun. So when the early settlers were trying to think of a name for their new town, they recalled this common sight and called their town Basking Ridge. So now we have three basalt mountains on top of a sedimentary rocks. And now it's shifting, we'll go, go north to parts of North America where it snows continuously and the snow never melts. The snowfalls accumulate, become compacted and recrystallize into ice. This repeats over and over again until it becomes so heavy, this layer of ice or a glacier becomes so heavy that it starts to move under its own weight. One such glacier came our way 50,000 years ago. It was called the Wisconsin Glacier. The Wisconsin Glacier was about 2,000 feet high and it moved about 10 inches per day. So how high is 2,000 feet? I know it's high, but it's hard to visualize. So I thought if we looked at this next picture, <laughs> am I moving this? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Magic, don't, don't move. <laughs> So high as two, so here you see the twin towers that fell on 21 years ago today. I was in New York City that day, and there's the memory memories of that day that I haven't forgotten. Each tower is 1,350 feet, 
So if we took half of that tower, that'd be about 600 plus feet and add it to the tower. So that would be 1350 plus 600 plus, that'd be 2000 feet. So that's how tall and how high the Wisconsin glacier was. Okay, we'll move, move to the next slide. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. So here comes the glacier. It's slowly moving toward us at about 10 inches a day. It's shearing off the tops of ridges and hills. It's scouring valleys. And because of its tremendous weight, it's pulverizing everything under it. And anything that doesn't get pulverized gets pushed in front of it. So here's the glacier and stops just north of Basking Ridge. Now, you see the glacier in the background and those three little ridges, little ripples in front of it. What is that? Well, that's everything that's been pushed in front of the glacier for the last thousands of miles. It's full of trees, ice, lots of rocks, unconsolidated sediments, and even boulders. This is called glacial till. And this is what you are sitting on today. Because the temperature is warmer here in Basking Ridge than where the glacier just came from, the glacier starts to melt. The glacial till has blocked all the gaps between the Wachung Mountains and formed a dam. So now we're sitting in a big bathtub here. So the, the, the glacier starts to melt slowly, the bathtub fills, and it overflows the dam that has been formed and spreads to the east. When the lake's all done and has been formed, it is 30 miles long and 10 miles wide. It goes from Patterson to Plainfield, north to Marstown. It's 200 feet deep and it's called Glacial Lake Passaic. So now you're sitting on glacial till in the bottom of a 200 foot lake. Welcome. <laughs> Glacial Lake Passaic is around for several thousand years. Meanwhile, the glacier is melting slowly. Glaciers melt from the front. So the glacier is now starting to recede and going back north where it came from. Now, Glacial Lake Passaic now no longer has a source of water. So it starts to drain. And today on September 11th, 2022, the Great Swamp is all that's left of Glacial Lake Passaic, and it's still draining. Someday it will be forest again, just like it was 50,000 years ago. There are two brooks in the Great Swamp that are draining, and they were formed by the glacier, and they're draining the swamp. And they drain into the Passaic River, which goes down the western edge of our uh, refuge. Uh, and then those three uh, travel together, down through the Millington Gorge, meanders east, goes through a gap between the first and second Wachung Mountains where Glacial Lake Passaic drained through, and finally meanders further east and finally empties into the North Bay. The Lenni Lenape Indians were the first inhabitants of the swamp. They liked the Wachung Mountains in the swamp because there was lots of fish and game available. And we know what kind of game is available because we see it all the time here in the refuge with the bears, the deer, the turkeys, uh, the, uh, coyotes. So we have a better idea. And now we have a better idea of what fish were in the uh, two rivers and the brooks, uh, the brook of the two rivers, after a survey that was done in 2015. Uh, Dr. Jared Studinsky, who was the former chair of the biology department at Frostford, Frostburg State University in Maryland, waded into our two brooks and the Passaic River with his net and his stun gun and to see what he could find. He found 29 species of fish, including pickerel, perch, sunfish, catfish, minnows, and one eel. <laughs> he also made a discovery that was not a fish. He found freshwater sponges in the swamp. Freshwater sponges will only grow where the water quality is high. These sponges, however, were covered with glassy barbs. So they were just for show and couldn't be used for anything. Now we see that the Indians were able to live off the land, but how about the early set settlers? What options did they have? Well, the water table here in the Great Swamp is very high. 
The, ground, the groundwater is right below the surface of the, of the ground. Under the, under the groundwater is 60 feet of shale, which is impervious to water. So the water has no place to go. So the drainage here is a real problem. So with this drainage situation and the glacial till, they were a very bad combination for anybody thinking about raising crops. But the early settlers didn't know this. So they planted crops and nothing would grow. Some settlers went bankrupt. Others kept trying and finally gave discouraged and moved away. So the remaining settlers now had to come up with a plan B. They looked around and saw lots of trees in the great swamp. So they thought perhaps maybe they could do something with lumber. Ready for the next slide. Oh, thank you. <laughs> in late 1700s, George Bachoven moved to the area and bought six acres here on Pleasant Plains Road and built a house. You probably recognize the house as now our home of the Helen Fiske Visitor Center here at the refuge. Talking to his neighbors, he was trying to figure a way how he could help to get a lumber business off the ground here in the swamp. So he was thinking about maybe putting a sawmill down on the western edge of his property where the Passaic River was. However, after checking out the levels in the river, they went up so down so much that uh, he didn't figure that the river would be a very good power reliable power, source of power, so he gave up on that idea. But the neighbors did have axes, so they chopped down the trees in the swamp and used the wood for railroad ties, wagon wheels for the war, and barges for the Mars Canal. Oh, thank you. The Mars Canal was dug in 1830 and filled with the water from Lake Apatcong. It was 100 miles long. It started at Phillipsburg, went up through Hackenstown, Waterloo Village, east over to Patterson, down to Newark, and ended up at Jersey City, uh, now by the uh, Liberty State Park. The barges uh, that the settlers made were pulled by mules. And it took five days to get to go the 100 miles across New Jersey. Barges going from the west to the east carried coal and lumber to the New York Harbor from Pennsylvania, from the anthracite coal mines. There were iron ore mines up at Andover and Waterloo Village, and also at Ogden, which is also in North Jersey. So the barges there going from east to west took iron ore, ore over to a smelter in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which was just a few miles west of Phillipsburg. During the 18th and 19th century, Brownstone was the building material of choice here in New Jersey, and New Jersey was the top supplier of it. Now, brownstone is a sandstone that has the mineral hematite in it. Hematite is dark red, so it gave this sandstone a nice brown color. There were three mines located on now Broomfield Avenue, right north of Newark. They were the major supplier of brownstone, and it was the major supplier of all the brownstone row houses that were built in New York City, Philadelphia, and Jersey City. Thank you. Pretty colored. A common characteristic of these row houses were stoops that went up to the first floor. Stoops is a Dutch word meaning steps. And it was very common in Amsterdam for people to build stoops up to the first floor to keep floodwaters out of their living rooms. After a while, people began to think these beautiful brownstone buildings epitomized luxury and architectural sophistication. So they started to use brownstone to build mansions, churches, and other special buildings. Okay. On the left is Nassau Hall on the campus of Princeton University. And on the right is Old Queens, which is on the uh, campus of Rutgers University. These are famous brownstones in our area, well-known. On the left is the old First Presbyterian Church in downtown Newark, and on the right is Lambert Castle in Patterson, which are examples of a church and a mansion built out of brownstone. The barge is built by Mr. Bachoven and his neighbors. We used to transport the brownstone used from the three mines 
to downtown Newark and Patterson, who were on the canal, it's where the mansions and the churches were being built. So what do these barges look like? The one on the left is probably owned maybe by a private owner or a small entrepreneur. You see the mule over on the left pulling the barge. The barge on the right, these all, by the way, were the same structure, just different sizes. The barge on the right is fully loaded, ready to go. Over on the right on the towpath, you can see the mule driver and also his mule grabbing some lunch before he starts his five-day journey across New Jersey. Okay, and the next one. This one on the left is a barge that had just arrived at the coal depot on Liberty State Park, which is in the New York Harbor. Um, it's carrying a load of anthracite coal from Pennsylvania to the New York Harbor. The one on the right is probably the largest barge used uh, on the canal. And you can see it's carrying brownstone to the downtown Newark and Patterson where the uh, mansions and the churches were being built. Ah! Right. <laughs> uh, when the Canal Society in uh, Waterloo Village was looking for artifacts and memorabilia for their museum that they were about to form, there were no barges still in existence. So all they had for their museum were just models of the barges and lots of photographs like mine. Then Hurricane Sandy hit in 2012. Eileen Scanlon lived in a house on the beach in Highlands, New Jersey, which is about three and a half miles south of Sandy Hook. After the flood damages were cleaned up from Hurricane Sandy and the beach restored, Eileen and several of her neighbors decided to raise their houses up on stilts so that their houses would be protected from, any, from flooding from many future storms. When they were raising Eileen's house, they made an amazing discovery. Eileen's house was sitting on a barge that was 11 feet wide and 50 feet long. An archeologist was called in as well as members of the Historical Society and the Canal Society. And after taking some tests and making several measurements, they confirmed that this was an original Mars Canal barge. So how did this barge get here? Well, Harry Brown, who lived in the former owner of this house, had a clam processing business here. He had dug a channel, built a dock, and a boathouse, and purchased an old beaten up barge that was no longer in service, and used it to haul seafood. Then in 1934, a big storm hit the Jersey Shore, and it took out his channel, his dock, and his boathouse, but it left the barge untouched. Mr. Brown then decided he had set the damage and decided that he didn't want to spend any more money to restore everything back the way it was. So he cleaned up the damage, and since the barge hadn't moved, he left it where it was and built his house on top of it. <laughs> now Eileen decided she wanted to donate the barge to the Canal Society. So the society had the gigantic task of trying to move this barge from underneath Eileen's house, 80 miles up to Waterloo Village. The society had no money in its budget to move, to pay for somebody to move this barge. So volunteers used a donated forklift and a donated flatbed truck and took apart this barge piece by piece and moved it 80 miles up to the museum. Now, I went to the Canal Day up at the Waterloo Village in June, and most of the volunteers I met there were my age. <laughs> so no matter what the age was of the volunteers at that time, this was a big job. Okay. Today, the bow of the barge is sitting proudly in the museum in Waterloo Village. It looks in still in pretty good condition considering all it's been through. But as I stood next to this newfound treasure, I couldn't help but wonder if maybe, just maybe, wood from the Great Swamp was used to build this barge almost 200 years ago. Okay, next slide. 
Now, Mr. Buckoban and his neighbors also tried to raise sheep for additional income. Raising sheep was apparently very easy to do in our part of New Jersey. Uh, sheep don't require much attention. You can put them out all day on marginal land to graze, which we had a lot of. You did have to have a barn though, because as you know, there's a lot of coyotes in the area here. And Mr. Well, you see the barn out in the back. Mr. Bakoban had a nice barn for his sheep. Most of the farms here in New Jersey were 25 people or less, farm uh, sheep or less. Some had prize winning sheep so they could have breeding operations as well as selling lamb. As more and more people started moving here to New Jersey as New Jersey became more developed, people were coming here from other countries as well as from other states. So the population was becoming more and more diverse. There were now ethnic groups that preferred lamb for their holidays and celebrations and then other kinds of meat. Uh, the biggest today, the biggest lamb consuming states here in the United States are here in the Northeast and on the West Coast. In 2015, New Jersey was fifth in the United States for lamb consumption. Today, there are 800 sheep farms in New Jersey. 90% of them are uh, 25 sheep or less, just like Mr. Bakoban and his neighbors. Uh, there are a handful that are 100 or more. The largest sheep farm in New Jersey is right here in Mars County. It's up in the Valley Shepherd Farm, which is in Long Valley, just west of Chester. They have 300 sheep and a sheep shop that sells 35 different kinds of sheep, cheese made from sheep stuff. <laughs> Let's say that fast. And they are made using the old style European methods. Now this farm only uses unpasteurized milk for making their cheese because raw milk is, has significant more health benefits and superior nutrition than pasteurized milk. However, the Food and Drug Administration here in the United States will not let anybody make cheese from unpasteurized milk unless the cheese is aged for at least two months. So the farm has a cave that's carved out of a hill where they age their cheese from anywhere from two months to nine months, depending on what kind of cheese they're making. Uh, they do have uh, trouble with not mice in the cave, like M-I-C-E is in uh, C is in cat, but with mites, T is in tub. The mites love the cheese. So they have to brush the cheese constantly to keep the mites from eating it. So two people sit every day, all day, in the cave, brushing the cheese. They don't control, they get pardon? Yeah, they get benefits? I'm not sure. <laughs> I know they do have, part, they have trouble people getting them to do it. Did you? Thank you. Yeah. Doesn't get out of the parking lot. Yeah, we can get the whole Well, is that right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, they certainly have different kinds. They don't control what the sheep eat. Uh, there are areas in the pasture that have clover. And the guide told me that they can tell when the sheep eat the clover because the cheese tastes differently. But the, but the customers don't seem to notice. Uh, the, the sheep only produce five months out of a year. So during the pre, uh, milk production season, the, milk, the wool grows and they get heavy and become very lethargic and don't feel like giving milk. So they shear the sheep during those months. And as a result, they have wool blankets for sale as well as cheese. Their biggest customer is Whole Foods. They have two stores in the United, in uh, this area, one in Summit and one in downtown New York. Uh, they're very proud of their business. Uh, they want you to come and see them and invite, invite you. They give tours, and so you can watch cheese being way, made in the old old-fashioned methods, as well as they'll take you in the cave, and you can watch the cheese being brushed. <laughs> <laughs> now we go to Madison, our neighbor to the east. Madison was covered by glacial Lake Passaic too. And when Lake Passaic drained, they received some unconsolidated sediments from several different sources as well as from the bottom of glacial Lake Passaic. And these unconsolidated sediments were able to form a soil that things could grow in. 
Thank you. When the Madison train station opened in 1837, some people in New York City saw this as an opportunity to come enjoy the grass and trees and the cooler temperatures in New Jersey. Some families like the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers built seasonal homes on Madison Avenue so that they could spend more time here in New Jersey rather than just a couple of days or a weekend. They tended to buy big pieces of land and build a home in the middle of it that was surrounded by large lawns and gardens. For instance, the Vanderbilt Trombleys bought 850 acres on Madison Avenue and had a staff of 125, 30 of whom were gardeners. So one day, several of these owners were chatting and said, you know what would be nice decorations for our homes that we have built here? Would be fresh cut flowers, like maybe roses. Another one said, yeah, that would be nice, but there's no florists in Madison. In fact, there aren't many flowers either. Then someone said, why don't we try to grow our own? If they're successful, we have plenty of gardeners to take care of them. So they bought some rose seeds and planted them. And the roses loved the glacial soil. The word, the word spread and farms popped up all over. They built greenhouses and fitted them with steam pipes so that the roses could withstand the harsh New Jersey winters. After a while, some growers entered their roses into national exhibitions and won awards for not only the quality of the roses, but also for the new varieties that were introduced. One such grower was Louis Noe. He developed a new rose called the American Beauty Rose that became very popular. In just 10 years, he became the largest producer of American Beauty Roses in the United States and had an exclusive clientele. Then came the requests of all requests. The planners of Queen Victoria's annual Christmas celebration in the castle called Mr. Noe and wondered if he could provide his American Rudy roses for the Christmas celebration. Wow, how great is that? Wow, but wait, how do you keep roses fresh for a week? while I go for across the water by boat. Well, Mr. Noe rose to the occasion. Sorry, I wanted to use another word, but I could think of one. <laughs> <laughs> Roses like cold. You want to keep them fresher longer, you keep them in cold water. So what Mr. Noe did is he cut the rose the night before and kept them in ice water overnight. And the next morning, early, he wrapped each rose in paper, damp paper with an ice and a potato. The ice would melt, the potato would get cold and stay cold much longer than the melted ice. We wrapped each rose in a foil, piece of foil, and off they went. They made it successfully and apparently were a big hit because several years after Queen Victoria died, Mr. Noe was asked to provide roses for the annual Christmas celebrations at the castle for Queen Victoria's son, King Edward VII, and the Queen Alexander. The rose industry thrived in this area for about 100 years. It reached its peak in 1950, when there were 45 farms, 90 greenhouses, and they were sending 50,000 roses per day into New York City from the Madison train station. Because of all this notoriety and activity, Madison was informally called the Rose City. Then what happened next happens to all of us at least once in our lifetimes. No good thing lasts forever, right? And the rose industry around Madison was no exception. Airplanes started to carry things in addition to passengers. So warm climates the, like the West Coast and several South American and Central American countries could now send freshly cut roses it would arrive early in the morning in New York City, the same time as the trains and the ferry from Madison. That competition was a killer. In addition, costs were going up and became more and more expensive to raise roses. In addition, Madison was becoming a commuter town, and so there's a big demand for housing. Developers were offering prices now for the farmers at prices they couldn't refuse. So they were exiting the industry. 
the rose industry stumbled and was gone by the 1970s. But Madison was not about to let, Madison was not about to leave. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Madison was not about to leave the name of Rose City die. So today the, there's a sign downtown Madison that welcomes visitors to the Rose City. To the right, the town logo still has the rose replacing the, the O in Madison. Another slide, thank you. Uh, several establishments downtown have kept the name Rose City in their name. Uh, Garlic Rose, Rose City Bakery Cafe, Rose City Limo, Rose City Vacuum, and Rose City Transmission, which is my favorite. <laughs> also, the Madison police on the upper right show their support for keeping the name of Rose City alive. And finally, the historical marker down on the right, which is a constant reminder of a robust industry that once was here. Now we can go back to my last visit to Basking Ridge, where a resident named F.W. Schmidt had a very successful carriage business. At the end of the century, there was talk going around about a thing called a gasoline engine. And so Mr. Schmidt began to write, realize that if he was to continue to be a successful businessman, he might need to think of another line of work. So in addition to the carriage business that he owned in Basking Ridge, he owned 180 acres down on Stonehouse Road in Millington. Because of uh, development going on in the area, crushed basalt was becoming very high in demand, not just for building houses on the foundations, but also for macadam for roads and ballast for railroads that were expanding at that time in the area. Uh, basalt was ideal because it's three times lighter than steel, has a tensile strength two and a half times the steel. It's resistant to chemicals and corrosion. And plus there was plenty of it. All three mountains were basalt. So seeing all this, Mr. Schmidt thought maybe there's a good chance of basalt being under his property. So in 1895, Mr. Schmidt and two of his friends opened the Millington Quarry. Thank you. Thank you. On the left, you can see the rock crusher in the uh, quarry. And on the right, you can see the conveyor belts and the piles of crushed basalt. Now up in the rim of the quarry, you can see a railroad track. Right to the left of the picture is the uh, Lions train station. Uh, I commuted along that train track for many years. Uh, I looked into the quarry, but I couldn't see any of the exciting things that were going on in the quarry. Uh, just for the record, that was 1990s, not the 1890s, okay? <laughs> the quarry operated for about 100 years and produced about 100,000 or a million tons of crush bulk of, of basalt per year. Now, when they were in mining in one of the lower levels of the basalt near the end of the quarry's life, they uh, Came, uh, became uh, associated with a different discovery. Now we have to remember that if they were in a lower level of basalt, this basalt was once on top of the ground, was one of the early extrusions millions of years ago. But this extrusion was a little bit different. When the hot lava came out of the ground, it apparently encountered some water, maybe perhaps a, sh a shallow tidal pool, and the basalt immediately hardened. The gas bubbles in the lava coming up behind it now were trapped in the hardened basalt and couldn't escape at the surface like they usually did. Then during the, during the many years that followed, the minerals in the basalt crystallized and filled the gas cavities. Here's a sample of what they found, just on one side, basalt. If you turn it around, you see the gas cavity with the crystals. The next slide, please. Next. But, oh, thank you. This is the same. This is the same sample. You see, there's two minerals in this sample. The one, the white crystals on the left are opophyllite, and the three uh, cubes on the right are iron pyrite, which is also known as field as fuel fool's gold. So the mine continued after they found two minerals, they kept mining. They found not five, not 10, 
but 20 new minerals. The word spread in the mineral industry couldn't believe what they were hearing. They, can't, they said, this can't happen. You don't find 20 new minerals in one place. We want to come and explore. So the quarry allowed mineral clubs to come and explore in the quarry. Uh, if it was just one mineral club, they could pull their cars into the quarry and they fill up their cars with whatever they could find. Now, there were two mineral clubs at the same time, which did happen. They had an off-site parking lot and a bus that brought the, the uh, collectors into the mine to explore for the day. Starting in the 1990s, the quarry sponsored an annual quarry education day, which they invited the students and their parents from the William Annan Middle School in Basking Ridge to come to the quarry for the day. The quarry would give a tour, provide a lunch, and then let the kids loose in a safe area and they could take home whatever they found. Boy, as a kid, I would have loved that. In fact, I'd go today if they invite me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Pectrolite was the mineral that everybody wanted to find, maybe because it was the prettiest. Pectrolite came in white, green, and pink. Some collectors have said that the pink pectrolite crystals are some of the best in the world. Harvard University has a very nice collection of pink pectrolite crystals from the Millington Quarry. Well, the Millington Quarry mined for another 10 years and then ran out of basalt. It shut down just 12 years ago in 2010. Well, now we've looked briefly at some of the interesting opportunities that the geology of our area and the glacier gave to their early settlers to earn a living. They say in life, you play the card you're dealt. I think the settlers did a pretty good job. Thanks.